it occurred to me that we were in a series called The Invitation, and I just wanted to come back to make sure that we really sewed that up so that we all understood a few things. And um, so, so I let the media team know this morning, this was going to be a freestanding one, just kind of, you know, my heart to you. But today we're back in to the invitation, and the title of the message is You Are the Invitation. But I didn't really leave that in there. It's just You Are. Um, and that's so that when somebody sees it on the YouTube, they're like, oh, I, what, what, what am I? I want to check it out. Um, so I, I thought we should come back before we wrap this whole series up then and talk about what it is exactly we are inviting someone to. Because there's a lot of, if you... If your Instagram feed looks anything like mine, it is full of, my, my Instagram feed is entirely full of preaching and then theological arguing. <laughs> it's just like, it's so, it's so annoying sometimes. And which? And babies laughing. Yes. As Tyson, Danita, and Amy know, I send several memes a week about little babies laughing hysterically. I don't know why I just love that so much. It moves my soul and I, I love it when babies are laughing, so... So they get a lot, and also interesting devices, like, like the back shaving thing. Have you guys seen this thing? Have any of you seen, what's it, what, Tyson, what's it called? I sent it to you. Did you see this yet? Yeah. It's like Backscape. It's called Backscape, and men, you're going to, ladies, some of you also, for those of you who struggle with back hair, it's a whole thing that just shaves your back, like, it's amazing, and so <laughs> that is a seriously tragic rabbit trail, um, before we even get started this morning. But that's what my Instagram feed is full of. Backscape uh, advertisements, uh, theological arguments, babies laughing. And uh, I realized that while most of you are probably in step on page with us, you, you get where we're going. Um, I don't want anybody to be left behind. And so what I see in the world around us is there's, there's two predominant ideologies that we see on church, and I think most churches are in the middle of this, but certainly it's not hard to find churches that go to the extreme. And so it's important um, doctrinally, theologically, for as much as it depends on us, for us to try and realize exactly where it is that we're supposed to be. Because the two camps are pretty radically different. One would be the progressive camp, which you hear a lot of uh, conservatives talking about these days. The progressive camp is so progressive that it is actually blaspheming and profaning God and his church. I mean, twisting scripture way out of context, uh, blessing things that God certainly doesn't bless. I think I, I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. I think we all have an understanding of, of what is wrong with the progressive and liberal ideologies that permeate some churches. But on the other side, we have the extreme conservative end, if, you, if we can call it that, conservative being more of a political title than a certainly doctrinal or theological title. But on the other side, we have what um, one of my Bible college profs back in the day, I'll never forget, just called the Holy Huddle. And the Holy Huddle is kind of those people who gather together and, and they build the walls of the church up high around them to protect themselves from the big bad world. And uh, probably some of you are familiar with that church as well. And, and I think that, I think that the, the right thing is probably somewhere in between those two in varying degrees at varying times and places, depending on the culture we're in. Certainly, if we were a church like in Nigeria, the conversation would look much different than it looks presently in North America. And if you can't understand that, you're going to have a hard time understanding anything that goes on. We are in a bit of a, of a bubble in North America. The rest of the world is not actually doing a lot of what North America is doing, in case you didn't know. This is, however, who we're called to. This is where God has established you and I in his church. And so we need to come to the understanding of what it is we are. What, what are we doing here? We're supposed to invite people. Well, to what? To something? I don't even know what it is. That might be where you're sitting this morning. So I think that we have the one side that profanes the church. And, and, and you might ask, well, why, like, why would you use that language? Well, because the bride of Christ, the church, the body of Christ, the gathering of believers, the assembly of God's people, of which Christ is the head, that is something that God has said is set apart as holy. And any time that we have groups of people that come in and try to make something that God has called holy, try to make it unholy, the word that is used there correctly is to profane it. So God's church is holy. He says, his invitation to us is be holy because I'm holy. 
And then we have these ideologies that would profane that holiness. Again, the other side would be the holy huddle. And so the problems that this causes are for the holy huddle, let's say. Um, believe in the relevance of the church, but believe that the church is a Sunday morning thing. And I've had discussions with good, dear friends of mine who would hold that opinion. The church is Sunday morning. Well, I have a problem with that because if church is only Sunday morning, what about all the other days of the week that people live and do life in? If the church is only Sunday morning, then, like, you know, like, I get it. People who are like, well, women shouldn't speak in the church. Well, that's fine if it's only Sunday morning. But what happens when you read the book of Acts and realize that the church was more like 24-7? Like, the church was always up to something. Like, the church was always gathering in people's homes. And so we have some of these, these cultural twists and complexities that when we read God's Word, we're not understanding all the way. We're not... We're not taking time. And at the same time, you can go so far the other way as to, as to misunderstand that Sunday is an incredibly important day of the week. Sunday was the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a big deal. You know what else 50 days later happened? It also fell on a Sunday. It was the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is when the promise of the Holy Spirit was realized by the church as like a mighty rushing wind, he blew in as though flames on the top of people's heads where they spoke with other tongues and thousands were added to their number. Sunday is a profoundly important day. And I see even in our church, there's, we got folks who forsake Sunday. It's not that important to them. I'd like you to reconsider your position. Sunday is profoundly important, but Sunday is not the only day for church. It's important to get this. See, the church needs to be creative and progressive in the sense that we are fishers of men. Has to be. I mean, if you want to catch fish, Jake and some of you boys, you like fishing, you put a hook on the line. Not too many people go out on the ocean without tackle, without a net, without some means of catching the fish, if they're fishermen. And so if we are fisher of men at the invitation of Jesus, then we, we got to be a little more progressive in some of our tactics. We have to have an awareness of what the culture in the world around us is saying, not so that we can argue, but so that we can set a hook. And some of you struggle with that. I know some of you some of you, maybe your doctrine doesn't really appreciate the whole part where we have an active role to play. I just challenge you to read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. Find out that there's a role for us to play. Men, women, children, all the same. There's something that God has called you to individually, and there's something that God has called you to corporately. And this is the blend, and this is the balance of what a church has to be and it is what we are ultimately inviting people to come and be a part of. So we can't compromise on the standard of what it means to join the body of Christ. And our holy huddle brothers and sisters, they have that right. They're a little too holy, a little too huddled, but they have it right that you can't belong before you believe. And some of you maybe have heard that expression. You can belong before you believe. Well, actually... That's hard to do. Because how can you belong unless you believe? And what, try, what we're trying to say, of course, is you can come and you can take some time and you can taste and see that the Lord is good. You can come and be a part. But it's a lot more than that, church. You see, what we're actually doing is inviting people to come and join us in the presence of God. That's what church is about. Church is about inviting people to come and be joined together in the presence of God. Now, there are other things that happen. Teaching happens. Training can happen. Fellowship happens. Breaking bread can happen. All of those things, that, they all can happen, but I want to I wanna remind you that we have to come back to one point, at one point alone at the end of the day, and that is that we are people of the presence of God. That's who we are. 
You are a person of the presence of God. I am a person of the presence of God. And here's the thing, church. If God's presence isn't in us, then what are we? Like if you came to church this morning and you're not the presence of God, in that you host his presence, in that you are a living tent, and that you are, uh, and you are the, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, how can it be that you and I are not the people of God's presence when we are the dwelling place of the presence of God? We're the people of his presence. And this means that we pursue his presence, we search for his presence, we come to worship him as he is present. We come to behold his glory. It's palpable many times when we gather for worship. You can, you can feel it in the atmosphere. There's no greater words, in my opinion, that can be sung than holy, holy, holy. That last song we sang, who could outcompose all of the angels and the saints? Face down at the throne, beneath the weight. The weight of what? Well, it's the weight of his glory. The weight of his presence. Sometimes we desperately fall short in this presentation because we could reduce, reduce church simply to worship. Why do we get together? Well, we get together to have a good worship team and sing great worship songs and feel the presence of God. Yeah, if we reduce church to only worship, we're missing the other half of why we exist. In the same way that churches who focus on evangelism but never invite or wait for the presence of God to fall, they're missing at least half of what God wants to do. I should clarify this too because I think I said um, at some point this morning that God shows up. And we use that as an expression, you know, um, when we worship, the presence of God showed up. I was praying and the presence of God showed up. Well, here's, let me, let me correct this with some truth. The presence of God was already there. Because David wrote that I could go anywhere. I could go to the highest mountain. I could go to the bottom. I could go, I could go to my mother-in-law's house. And even there, I would find your presence. <laughs> Zing, yeah. <laughs> I'm really full of courage when my mother-in-law's not here, right? Um, anywhere we go, the Bible says emphatically that there we will find your presence. Even in hell. Even in Sheol was the Hebrew word. Now, there's people who argue about that. Whoa, does it really mean hell eternally? Don't worry about that. God's point is when he says this to us, that yes, even in hell, my presence will still be there. And so it's really weird for us to say things like, yeah, God's presence showed up. What we mean is there was a veil that was removed and we entered God's presence. I don't want to use the word interdimensional. <laughs> because it's kind of a loaded word. But there is more than one realm, the Bible says, that we exist in. There's the realm of the seen, and there's the realm of the unseen. And so what I would propose to you this morning is something like this, that God's presence was here as we gathered in this place already, but when we began to worship God, the veil was removed, and we entered freely in and out of his felt presence. That can only happen at church. Did you know there's a presence of God that can only be experienced in corporate worship? And that's not to say God's presence doesn't exist everywhere else. It's just to say there are values of who he is. There is a part of his nature that can only be experienced in a corporate sense when we as his people gather and call on his name and ascribe things like holy, greatness, worthiness to his name. That's what's happening at church as we corporately worship. And that is not to take anything away from. That is not to say that you can't experience the profound, palpable, wonderful presence of God when you're all alone driving across town in your pickup truck. Because I meet with God all the time by myself, and I have overwhelming experiences in his presence just the same. But you see, we're talking about what we're trying to invite people to. We're inviting people to the presence of God. We're inviting people to come and see what it's like when God actually inhabits the praises of his people. 
We're trying to invite people to come and, and see what it's like when Jesus enters a room and we begin to have access to him in a spiritual way and lives are changed like this. That's what we're inviting people to. Maybe, maybe this language would help me to describe this with the presence of God. Um, it's like being in the same room with my wife. Some of you are immediately going to understand this. Some of you, you're going to learn one day when you get married. Now, and she, and she will tell you this because we actually have discussions about this uh, fairly often, and I think most marriages, if they're talking, do. You see, so I can be in the same room as my wife, so I can be in her presence. But how many of you know that just because I'm in her presence does not mean I am engaged with her emotionally or spiritually. I'm in her presence, but I'm not in her presence. How many of you can relate? God is the one who chose a marriage to help us understand what our relationship with him might look like. And so I would suggest that like in a marriage or like in other earthly relationships that we can see, that we can actually take part in, there is this reality that we face where we are in the presence of God, but we're not in his presence. And it's true that you'll invite people to church and they will be in the presence of God, but they will never enter the presence of God. It's hard to have language to describe what we see and what we experience as we live and move and have our being in Jesus. But I really believe as a church that we're called to try. And I think it's really important that we try. Because at the end of the day, when I go home on Sunday after church, Pastor Naomi and I grab a nap. That's all, nothing else, just a nap. What I wonder as we get to Sunday night, and I'm going to close my eyes and say goodbye to Sunday, honestly, week after week, I'm like, God, did anybody, did anybody get closer to you today? And I got to tell you, that, like, that's the burning question of my life. Did anybody get closer to God today? Did anybody, did anybody become more intimate with you today? And my hope is the answer is yes. Sadly, I think sometimes the answer is no. And then the Holy Spirit has this very loving way of not letting me forget that I have to ask that question of myself. Well, did, did I? Did my intimacy with Jesus grow today? Did I become more like him today or am I the same still? We need to be a church that is moving people closer to Jesus in a tangible way, in, in a recordable way, in, in a way that we can, we can look and say, yes, we can answer the question, yes, people are moving closer to Jesus. They are starting to look more like Jesus. They are starting to act more like Jesus. That takes more work than some people are willing to commit. It's incredibly important that we live in the presence of God in this way. That I live in the presence of God in a way that wants you to live in the presence of God. Parents, that you live in the presence of God in a way that your children, your, your children become hungry for the presence of God. Grandparents, can you live in a way that causes your grandchildren to want to, to desire to live and to be in the presence of God? We want people to experience that relationship with Him. And that's what we're inviting them to. So it's incredibly important that we live in the presence of God in that way. Because that's where freedom comes from. 
The world around us is in bondage. The world around us is in decay, in need of life. They are in need of being set at liberty. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 15 to 18, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lays over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. This is talking about the access that people used to have to the presence of God. When Moses went up the mountain and met with God, he came back down. His face was so bright, reflecting the memory of his time in the glory of God was bright. And that was miraculous. If you can just imagine the context with me this morning that, you know, if you go and see God, the Bible says you die. Yet Moses experienced a face-to-face encounter with God where God hid him within the cleft of a rock, spared his life. And as Moses comes back down from that time with God, his face is the image of God. It's the glory of God. And that glory faded. So the Bible is telling us, 2 Corinthians, that the reason Moses had to put a veil over his face was so that the people didn't see the glory fading. And Paul's writing in this case, and, and even in verse 15, whenever he, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil still lays over people's heart. Church, do you understand that the world around us, there's a veil over their heart? They say, well, they're not even, they, they're, they're seculars, they're humanists, they, they don't even acknowledge God's law. Actually, they do. Even the most secular person among us in our city thinks it's wrong to steal. That law that Moses brought down from the mountain, the vast majority of people in our world fully, wholeheartedly agree with most of that law. You shouldn't shouldn't murder. You shouldn't steal. But their hearts are veiled. See, you and I are supposed to be transformed into the image of the glory of God. So that in just the way the face of Moses reflected the glory of God, when the people would look at him, they said, man, we know that guy was in the presence of God. His face is so shiny. He is literally glowing. But it faded. The New Testament reality, because what Jesus did says that we should behold the glory of Jesus and we should be so changed by it that everyone can look at us and see that our face is unveiled. They don't need a veil, that our face is uncovered, begin to look like Jesus. We begin to reflect the glory of the Lord. But it's a reflection that doesn't fade. And by the way, if the reflection of Jesus in your life is fading Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm just going to suggest to you that something is wrong. Something's wrong. Because we've received a glory that doesn't fade in the presence of God. We don't have a veil between us and the presence of God. The corporate presence, the personal presence, it's all there for us all the time. And don't mistake that the fact that on Tuesday you're not shining as brightly as you were on Sunday when you left church. Don't mistake that for complete failure. It does tell us that we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. In other words, from encounter to encounter with the Lord. And the reason for the reflection of Jesus' glory is what? Well, it's so that people will turn to the Lord. 
Because whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You can be a secular humanist and agree with two of the ten, ten commandments, and there's a veil, but the moment you turn to the Lord, the veil gets taken away. And then you begin to see that the law of the Lord is perfect, that it delights my soul, that it's trustworthy, that what it says will make me wise, that the commands of the Lord are, are light, that the commands of the Lord endure forever, that his promises are faithful and true. When the veil comes away, the reason for the reflection of Jesus' glory is so that people can turn to the Lord. And this does line up with the rest of Scripture because Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does, any light, does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, now here's the important part, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, when we move in good works as unveiled people reflecting the nature of Jesus, somebody is going to turn to the Lord. And when people turn to the Lord, their veil is removed and they are impacted by the Spirit of God, the Lord, the Spirit of liberty. And you see, liberty is what the Spirit of God brings everywhere He goes. And the result of that will be people being transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus. What Moses had was temporary, but what we have is eternal. The context matters because you're inviting people to, some, to something every moment of your life. We could go through the series called The Invitation, and you could walk away thinking, yeah, I'm supposed to invite people to church. That would only be partially right. You should invite people to church. You should invite people to come and sit in the presence of God with you. But if that's all it is, it's not enough. It has to be an invitation to life in Christ. The same life that you know. The same life that you know. Sometimes I get a little worried when I look at the world around us and I don't know if it's because of a lack of inviting or because it's a lack of life. Can I just challenge you with a really, I guess, serious question this morning? Is the fact that you're not inviting someone to life in Christ because you yourself don't feel like you have life in Christ? Now, I'll be completely transparent with you there are days in my life where I don't really feel that alive in Christ. Just in case you thought you were all of a sudden going to hell. But like I said a few moments ago, something is wrong then. So something is wrong when we are not in possession of the life of Christ. Because we're not much of an invitation when we don't carry his life. See, you and I are the invitation as much as anything else could be the invitation. And some people right away, they get their spines up a little bit or they get a little defensive. But let me just say, why not you? Like, why can't you be the invitation? Why can't you be what God is using to draw someone closer to himself? Why can't, why can't it be you? And I think often the logical conclusion to that discussion, because hopefully it becomes a discussion, is that you just don't want to. You don't feel like it. Maybe because of apathy, but maybe because you feel desperately underqualified. But let me just circle back to the question. Well, why not you? 
Well, if I'm going to be honest, it's because I feel underqualified. Well, if you feel underqualified, you're looking to the wrong place for qualification. Because God does want to use you. God does want to use you to bring people into the kingdom of God. Well, Pastor Trav, I don't really agree with that. I don't care if you don't agree with that. Hear me. Jesus said the field is already ripe. It is white unto the harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest send workers into his field. What, what do you think workers do in a field that is ready to harvest? Anybody know? You cut down the stalks of grain and you bring them into the granary. And, and I, you, 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 everybody should garden more. Everybody should start farming. Because so much of the Bible speaks to the culture, the nuances of what it means to put a grain of wheat in the ground and watch it grow and deal with the weeds and deal with the frustration and deal with the things that can go wrong and deal with the things that go right and deal with the joy of the harvest. And some of you... The closest you're ever going to get is that farm life game on your phone. You are the invitation. I've watched a lot of people botch it. I have botched this. I remember one time, guys, when I was... A teenager, I had my unsafe friend come to a church production called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. <laughs> a few of you chuckled because you remember Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. It was, it was, uh, it was interesting. And, and not entirely bad, not entirely effective. Um, <laughs> just, it, it, was, it was what it was back in the day, and I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing it at all. Um, it just was what it was. But I remember one night sitting there after, because the way it worked is you, you invite a friend to come, and then, you know, you're the, one of the performers in the play, and that's the hook. And so you, you get them to come to this church thing, and, and they come, and then afterwards, you're supposed to sit down, have a coffee and a cookie, and then kind of talk and visit with people. And, you know, what, what this was, was, a, it, was a, it was a way of relationally engaging with people to try and share the gospel with them. Again, it's not, it's not that it's bad. But here's where I botched it. My friend who I'd grown up with, who I'd finally gotten to come to a church thing, I hand him a leaflet at the end of the thing, and here was my invitation. Richard, you should really read this. That is a crappy invitation to life in Christ. Like, that was terrible. That was a complete and utter failure. I'm embarrassed of that. What a waste of time. What a waste of relationship. Oh, here's a pamphlet. You should probably read this. He was my friend that spent many days a week with me. But what I didn't understand was that I was the life of Christ. What I didn't understand as a 16-year-old kid is that I was the image bearer of Jesus in his life. And church, if we could have Every believer in Jesus in this city, lit on fire by the Spirit of God, as image bearers of Jesus, our invitations will begin to look a lot different. Because some of you do this, hey, you should really come to church and you'll hear our pastor. Do you, do you know that I don't prepare a message every single Sunday just so you can bring a friend to church? I, I, that's not why I do it. If that's all it was, if church, if all church was, was you guys come and, and bring some friends and then I'll preach the gospel to them, if that's all church was, I wouldn't have to prepare. I wouldn't have to do any more studying. I know how to present the gospel to people. See, what we do in church as a whole is we try to become more like Jesus. And so there's teaching that happens in church. And teaching brings people along in their maturity. And we're changed because of what we hear, what we encounter in the Word of God. And yes, every single Sunday, we do present the gospel in our church. We talk about Jesus and the work he did at the cross and why that's meaningful and why you should respond to his gift 
of eternal life. But that's not the invitation to make. The balance that we're trying to strike, the balance of both and, is actually the key to life in the kingdom of God. See, we're called to personal growth and maturity because we need to grow personally. And some of you need to be more mature. It's it's okay. But we're also called, while we're growing and while we're maturing, to bring other people along with us. Because as you've heard it said before, everybody's leading someone. Like someone is watching you, someone is following your move. What happens so often is what God does in the lives of people in a a church service, maybe like this one. He does something profound. He does something in your heart. He lifts your burden. The the psalm we sing, I leave it all at the cross. Here I will lay my guilt. What, What great words. And they're especially great and they're especially powerful if you mean it and you actually do it. You know, maybe this is worth saying right now. You guys, when we come to church corporately, there are things that God wants to do corporately. Like, like God wants to inoculate everyone in the room all at once for their guilt and their shame. That's the corporate reality of church. Everybody who came this morning dealing with guilt and shame, which is most of us at some level, like if we're really willing to be honest, we're all dealing with guilt and shame at some level. And we get to sing corporately together in the presence of God, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Here I will lay my guilt and my shame. That is a profoundly great thing. If you, if, if you sincerely did something with that. Like, did you? As we sang that song this morning, did you lay your guilt and shame back at the cross once again to say, I don't want to carry that out of this place when I go. Because if you didn't, what are you inviting people to come and do? And so often what happens in the church is people forsake it. They forsake the assembling of themselves together. They, they, they show up with half a heart and they kind of come in and they go out early and they don't really participate corporately. And then what happens is, is you still carry your guilt and your shame. And then some point in the week, I have to have a meeting with you. And what we could have done corporately, we're now doing individually. I just, that was for, that's for somebody sitting here this morning. Like, like don't be the cow that won't come in to the corral. We hate chasing cows. We want to deal with it all at once, wherever we can so that we can focus on other things. Too many churches have staff positions dedicated to things that could be dealt with in the presence of God on a Sunday morning. Do you know that counseling is not a, it's not a fruit of the Holy Spirit? Neither is it a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, before you think you're smarter than me, yes, he is wonderful counselor. Jesus said he is the counselor, the Holy Spirit is. But what I'm trying to say is nowhere in Scripture did, it give, did God give to the church counselors, self-help gurus. I just need you to hear this this morning, church. In the corporate reality of the church, what God wants to do en masse is change a bunch of people at once. Because that's worth inviting someone to, isn't it? If we're just inviting people to come to a time of reflection and never change, what's the point? I don't want to invite people to come to a time of reflection. Come to our church. It's a really good self-help organization. That's not a church. (sighs) 
We're inviting people to life in Christ. We're inviting people to instant change in the presence of Jesus. Instant change. Miraculous change. Yeah, I want to see miracles, Pastor Trav. Like, I want to see the dead raised. I want to see a person's leg grow back. But you don't even have faith to see someone get saved every week. And let me ask you, in eternity, in the light of eternity, which is the greater miracle? Worship team, you can come back. Um, Guys, finding the balance of how to invite people, how to balance that with your own process of maturity and spiritual growth, how to balance that with your your immaturity and your assumptions, presumptions, the things that you don't know, your inadequacies, your lack of qualification, the balance of all those things can only be found in following Jesus. Your invitation is only valid if you're following Jesus. Because if you don't mature, if you stay a baby in your faith, if you stay a baby in your doctrine, if you only become a toddler in love and holiness, what good can be done? God is always looking to move his people. He is the great shepherd. So he is always looking to move his people from the place they are to the place they need to be. And some of you might have come in this place this morning and you're a lost sheep. You're a sheep that has no shepherd. And I want to tell you this morning what God wants to do is move you from the place you are, shepherdless, lost, into his fold. Because that's the gospel. That's the good news of what Jesus is. You're a rebel. You're a sinner in need of grace. And Jesus came and died on a cross so that your sin could be forgiven by his work, not your own work, but by his work. And we bend our will. When we bend our will, when we bow our knee, and when we recognize and submit to his lordship, in a moment, something changes in us. We're brought into the family of God. And it takes faith to do that takes faith to say, I'm going to trust you, Jesus. And church, for the rest of us, I need you to remember this. We are called as Generations Church. Here's our language. I want you to remember that we are a hospital, we are a family, and we are an army. That's what we are. We're a hospital, we're a family, and we're an army. And some of the people that you are the invitation to, you're an invitation to say, come to the hospital. Some of you, some of us, some of the time, are an invitation to say, come to this family. You're welcome here. And yet, there's other times where you and I are the invitation that says, come and join this army. Because there's a war going on, and the lamb is going to win. You're the invitation. God could use someone else. God could use something else. But why should God have to? Like, why should he have to use someone else? When you're right here, why should God have, like, tell me for real, someone give me an answer. Why should God, looking over our church family, 
have to find someone else. <laughs> None of us in this moment are going to say, that would be an acceptable thing to... He shouldn't have to look over us. Here am I, send me. I'll do it. We taught our children, we put it on our fridge. Whatever you say, I will obey right away. It worked too. Listen, when you stand before Jesus, what do you hope to hear him say? For those of us who've been churched enough, what, what do we hope? Somebody say it out. Well done, good and faithful servant. You all get 10 gold stars. Great job. Now, let, let, me, let me ask you. Do you think God's going to say, do you think Jesus is going to say that to you because your doctrine was the best? Do you think he's going to say it to you because you volunteered more than anyone else? Do you think he's going to do it because you got parent of the year two out of 42 years? Like, why? So here's the question. Why does Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant? Are you ready for this? It's because you loved him, you obeyed him, and you reflected his glory. That's it. What about, what about all this stuff? The other stuff is the working of holiness and perfection in our life by the Spirit of God. Here is the basic thing. Do you love Jesus? Do you obey Jesus? And are you reflecting his glory? Because that's what he's coming to reward. He's going to reward those who obeyed him, those who loved him, and those who look like him. Let's stand together. I'm going to sing one last song. If you want prayer this morning, our prayer team is over to my right, far away from the drums because the drums are loud. And I'll just say this, guys. If you're here this morning, and may maybe you sang the song and you didn't lay down your burden, you didn't lay down your shame, why don't you just let someone pray with you about that this morning so it doesn't have to be a pattern in your life. Maybe you're sick. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe there's a million things going wrong. I want you to know you don't have to leave this place the same way that you came. We have beautiful, friendly, loving, trustworthy people who want to pray with you. They came today, prayed up, just so they could pray with you. Now let me pray for you, and we're going to sing this last song. We do that to give you a moment to reflect on what you heard today. So Father, I just, with every person in this room this morning, acknowledge your holiness, your greatness, your worthiness, your love for us. And I say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for all of those realities. And now, Holy Spirit, my prayer is that you would put your finger on, that you would help us make sense of what we heard today. Because, Holy Spirit, if I want to be transparent, I feel like it's a lot of words and it's a lot of mess. But Lord, I know you're speaking to people right now. Jesus, we just want to reflect you. We just want to obey you. We just want to love you. And Holy Spirit, we desperately need your help so that those things can become not just desires of our heart, but realities in our lives. So Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would do it today. Amen. Let's sing.